Dr. Dick mentioned the name of a person that uh, I had not heard uh, of in years and years until he had mentioned it uh, uh, in his presentation uh, in Sherman last week. Uh, as a little boy, I remember sitting in the uh, living room floor looking at that tiny black and white uh, screen of the television set and uh, uh, there was a, a lady on there who uh, was saying things that I was too young to understand what it was she was saying or where she was going with her comments is Madeline Murray O'Hare and the one thing that that little boy took away was how angry this woman is mad. I, yeah, I was too young. I didn't get it. But I did know that she was an angry woman. And brother, that leads into um, our topic this afternoon. You know, anger is, at least in my opinion, hallmark of the 21st century. Brother, and I'm not talking about the anger caused by a mental impairment or some kind of chemical imbalance. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what we see today where anger is literally a lifestyle. A lifestyle where the first reaction to almost anything that comes up is anger, confrontation, labeling of someone else's intellect or motives and never giving the benefit of the doubt, but eager to express disrespect and to confront even on things that someone doesn't know much about or it's none of your business. In the behavioral sciences, there is a term called free-floating anger. It comes up a lot. It's just this kind of undefined angst that people carry with them on all kinds of subjects. They're just across the board. Politically, people, the fact is everybody appears to be angry with someone else and over a variety of things, and everybody is mad at the president. There's questions that people have about authority. Question authority, we see it all the time. And people are constantly ready to criticize. My wife and I have kind of made up a term we call the yeah buts. People are in situations where it doesn't matter who it is you mentioned. You know, we used to have heroes, men and women who we would look to. And everybody knew they were human and they had flaws, but nobody dwelt on them. We looked at what they accomplished in life. Not today. Yeah, yeah, you know, he, he did a lot. But what about this? What about that? What about this? What about this? bringing that individual just as low down the human totem pole as possible. Anger as a lifestyle becomes directed at others over some perceived inconvenience. May not even make sense. I remember the other day, actually some time ago now, I was uh, going through a, an online shopping experience, and I was looking at the reviews. Um, this item I was looking for was a uh, controller uh, for a solar panel. And um, it's not an expensive item. At the time, it was about $6. So it's not some high-tech goodie at all. And so I, was, I came on to uh, a review, and it had one star, 
And there was about three paragraphs. And, you know, in each of them, three or four lines long. And, well, I've got to read this. If that may not be the piece of equipment I'm looking for. And so I was reading through it. And the individual who wrote that review just ground on and on and on about how inconvenienced they were because the item that they had ordered had gotten there the day after they were promised to get it. Now, look, in all fairness, that may have been a really important piece of equipment for something he was working on, maybe some kind of job. I understand that. But please, I am way too lazy to put that kind of energy into hating something so much. It just, I don't know. It was all because of his perceived inconvenience. People also get upset and spun up if they perceive that someone else is sliding them kind of casting a jaundiced eye at them, even though they may not be looking at them at all. And they get upset over some alleged injustice. And woe well be it to you if you say no to someone. You got to be careful in the use of that word because people don't like being told that, no, you can't have that. No. I'm not selling you that. No, you're too young for that. You have to be careful. Popular culture overall wrestles with this thing of anger. Look, social media immediately comes to mind. It's something that we look at, and while on one hand, we make important use of the internet and all the good things out right now. Taking a look at the number of empty seats here in the congregation today, I suspect we've got a quite a large internet audience today. And rightly so because of the COVID situation. So it's, it's a powerful tool, a good tool. Yet on the other hand, we know and I'm not going to go into details about what comes out of social media. But it can be defined by one thing, and that's anger. We see it every day. We also see it in our music, in our entertainment. Interesting conversation with a, a cousin of mine who has a background in theater and television. And uh, her um, uh, granddaughter uh, had uh, participated, in fact, helped write and produce a, a small play. And so my cousin went to the play, of course, to support her uh, granddaughter. And uh, a few days later, I had an opportunity to talk to her about it, what would you think? How did it turn out? She said, you know, as far as the writing and the production value, those young folks did a great job. No question. All of them talented. But Al, where does all the anger in that play come from? These are young men and women who have never missed a meal in their life. And this play was mad and exposed elements of anger from the opening to the closing. She was puzzled, absolutely puzzled. Now, having said that, let me change direction just a little bit. Brethren, anger is simply a human emotion. It is. Each of us know what I'm talking about. And in fact, there is a place 
for anger. And we see that in God's hands, anger is a powerful tool. He uses it with precision. We call it generally righteous indignation. It's what I'm talking about. And there are specific characteristics about anger that God uses. He's not flippant about it. For example, when God expresses anger, he is directing that anger at a specific person for specific behavior. For example, you remember the story out of Exodus 4 when God's really started engaging with Moses and trying to bring him along and so that he could use him in the extraction of ancient Israel and that family from Egypt. And we see in Exodus 4, starting in verse 10, and Moses said to the Lord, this is at the point, keep in mind that God was telling Moses, we're going to make you a spokesman. You're going to talk on behalf of ancient Israel. Verse 10, and Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, skipping ahead a bit. I am slow of speech, slow of tongue. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, whoa, 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 who made your mouth? Who makes the dumb and the deaf to hear in the seeing or the blind? Have I not done that, said the Lord? Verse 12, now therefore, Go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Not to be deterred, though. Verse 13, And he, Moses, said, Oh, my Lord, please send somebody else, and by his hand you will send your word. Verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. So at that point, God just kind of threw up his hands. Anger also in God's hands has another characteristic and that is, it is proportional to the circumstances. Remember verse 14 that we just read. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. The Hebrew word for anger actually denotes more of a face of displeasure. God kind of made a face, probably. You know, he just didn't burn Moses down. But he did express his uh, displeasure. Probably took a deep breath before responding. Then he said, all right, all right, we'll use your brother. We see that anger in verse 14 is also translated as long-suffering with a difficult situation in uh, Numbers 14, verse 18. Another characteristic of godly anger is that it is always corrective. God never is motivated, nor does he desire to injure anyone. It's not his goal, not his purpose. In Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 2 verse 20, talking about Israel and that they had disappointed him and how that they had disappointed him. In verse 20 it says, for of old time I have broken your yoke, I have burst your bands, and you've said, I will not transgress. 
when at the same time upon every high hill, under every green tree, you have wandered and played the harlot. In other words, words were cheap. Verse 21, yet I have planted you as a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then are you turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me. Skipping ahead to verse 29, wherefore will you plead with me? You all have transgressed against me. Verse 30, in vain I have smitten your children and they did not receive correction. God is saying here that in his anger, he corrected Israel, and they would not take the correction. He didn't correct them to hurt them, to injure them. He expressed his anger and his correction to pull them back to reality. Christ explained this in Revelation 3, verse 19. I'll just read it, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. But you know, God, or rather, uh, brother, in the um, fact is that anger in the hands of man takes on far different characteristics, far different. Anger in man's hands has costs, and it's very, very expensive and causes real-time damage in people's lives. Socially, for example, kind of an innocent example, who wants to be around someone who is perpetually angry? Look, we all know people who kind of live in a perpetual state of drama and upset. Are they fun to be around? Am I fun to be around when I'm in that mindset? Of course not. Proverbs 26, verse 1. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. And we're told to avoid such people. Again, Proverbs 22, verse 10. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Brethren, anger in man's hands is especially corrosive in families. Anger is an unfortunate component in many families. It's almost a game sometimes, especially among siblings. How many buttons can I push in so-and-so by the end of the day? It's all in fun. Yeah, well, sometimes. Paul addressed the issues of anger in families. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves into your husbands as it is fit to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Verse 21, fathers, in very serious warning to the men, the fathers, young and old, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Paul admonished the Ephesians also. In Ephesians 4, just breaking into the thought of verse 30, it indicated that uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And then Paul swung right into verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Brethren, those verses started out in verse 30, 
where Paul was admonishing the Ephesians to not grieve the Holy Spirit, indicating that the Spirit of God is grieved when we act and react in bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor. So we have to be aware of that. You know, brethren, too, the uh, fact is that when I say that anger is expensive, it is expensive literally in terms of dollars and cents. Interesting study occurred, not just a study actually, um, in 1997, I read this interesting uh, article about an event that took place starting in 1997 involving Shell Oil Company. For those of you who have been around Texas for any length of time, you will understand oil is a big deal in Texas. And when you go off the coast of of uh, Texas out into the Gulf Coast, you see these big drilling platforms. They've been out there for many years. They started doing offshore drilling a long time ago. And it was possible because that water depth is low enough that they can bring these big drilling platforms sink pylons down two and three hundred feet and secure those drilling platforms and then conduct their drilling exercises off of those platforms. But the oil companies and the petroleum industry for years knew that the big oil is found way offshore in water at a thousand plus feet in depth, 1,000, 2, 3, 4,000 foot depth before you get to the seabed. No way could they take a drilling platform and run pylons that deep and secure those platforms. So they started working. Shell put their engineers on a project where they started developing a whole new technology to where they could develop an offshore drilling rig that was not secured to the seabed. And they started working on that platform. They called it URSA, U-R-S-A was its name. Project, $1.4 billion at the time, quite a lot of money. A lot of money today for that fact. This was the first of what are called deep focus drilling platforms. They're very common now, but at the time, this was the very first one. Designed to be able to drill in ocean depths below or deeper than 1,000 feet. There was a problem and shell management knew it as they started developing this plan. This article is really good because there were a lot of really good minds looking at this. And the shell management understood the old school management techniques in the oil patch and on the current drilling platforms. There's a term called rig rules. R-I-G-R-U-L-E-S, rig rules. What that says, you've got the driller, and then you've got all the roughnecks, and the driller plays the tune. You do what you're told. You don't ask questions. You don't offer suggestions, and you do not show weakness. They don't want to listen to it. Got a job to do. That's what we're out here to do. 
Those were rig rules, rough environment. Growing up, we had drilling all around us out in the panhandle. And uh, uh, I, just from being a little boy and watching, even I came away from uh, some of the, watching some of that thinking, wow, these guys are, this is a rough place to work. Shell management knew it wasn't going to work, though, with this new technology, it just wouldn't. Because it was going to require collaboration at many different levels. Because they're dealing with technology they had never used and had never been applied to the petroleum industry. They brought in a French psychologist, Claire Neuer. She went through the drilling division and realized that there was a deep culture of anger and aggression. That's what fueled that group, primarily men. That's what fueled those men to be able to go out and put in those crazy, long, long weeks and months in days that they had to work, literally out in the middle of nowhere. They also understood it's not going to work, not with what we're facing now. So she started developing classes, seminars, and going systematically through the drilling division. It took a two-year process. By the time the deep focus drilling platform was ready, she had the crews ready to man it. They were able to take it offshore. She was able to stop this thing of where the offshore drillers were a law to themselves, bled that out of the system completely. And brother, in the net effect, in 1999, the platform was deployed. And the accident rate on that platform was 84% less than any other drilling platform. Productivity skyrocketed and exceeded not just the benchmark for Shell, but exceeded the benchmark for the entire petroleum industry. They set new standards that came by identifying anger and bleeding it out of the system. Brethren, when we talk about these things, what about you? What about me? After all, we live in the 21st century with everyone else. We use social media. We see what's going on. What does it mean to God's people when we live in a society that is built on a culture of narcissism, materialism, and anger? Brethren, can't we be angry too? Everybody else is. After all, with what we know, who else has more of a right to be angry at what we see? Well, we're told in Ephesians, Paul again mentioned, four, Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, and I'll just refer to it, but he talked about being angry and sinning not. Why? Because it gives place to Satan. It is a door into our lives. We need to be careful with it. Keep that door shut to Satan. You know, we talked about anger in the hands of man. Talked about several of those characteristics. But there are other characteristics that I want to take just a moment and add to what we already know. You know, there was a 
king, his name was Asa. And we'll look at him in just a moment because he'll be an example of something where a seed of anger lodged itself in his arrogance, in his vanity. Now things started out really well for Asa as king of Judah. Right off the bat, he honored God, seemed to be careful with his relationship with God. Second Chronicles 14. Second Chronicles 14. So Abijah slept with his fathers, and he buried, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. And in his days, the land was quiet 10 years. And Asa did that, which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. So what we see here is a connection between the peace, probably prosperity, but certainly peace that Judah enjoyed and Asa's conduct that was righteous and something that God appreciated and respected. And we see the results if we continue reading through chapter 14 and 15. Something happened, as so often does. Second Christ, that gold and silver back, but it's not too late to go repent. And I'm going to take care of that right now. Verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him into prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing, and Asa oppressed some of the people some of the time. Asa fell victim to the vanity of his office. His anger rose, and he literally became unteachable. Another characteristic that we see popping out in people's lives, that's speaking evil of authority, and we've already touched on that to a degree. But it's more than just that. It's anger at not getting their own way when this comes up a lot of times. Look, brother, I don't care what your political persuasions are. Don't care. But since the elections in 2020, the one thing I think we can all agree on, that the veneer of civility in this country has literally been torn away and is no more. Peter discussed something. Second Peter, chapter 2. 2 Peter 2, 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust for the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignity. Moving on to Jude, Jude 1 8, or I should just say Jude 8, since there's just one chapter. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when continuing with the devil, he disputed over the body of Moses. He did not bring a railing accusation against him. Instead, he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of those things, which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beast. In those things, they corrupt themselves. A third characteristic that pops out in people's lives that Anger becomes a source of unnecessary strife and trouble. We see in Proverbs 
29, verse 22. Very simple. An angry man stirs up strife. A furious man abounds in transgressions. Transgressions, what are they? We already know transgressions. In 1 John 3, 4, whosoever commits sins transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Anger, we don't get it checked. It leads to this very thing where our lives take on dimensions that cross the line with God's law. And in anger, we can say to ourselves, oh, well, that's okay, this one time. Is it? Proverbs 15, 8, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. And another characteristic of anger, and this is so illustrative, of how anger distorts expectations. You just can't get a good view of things. Jonah, we all know his story. We all understand that, that God took Jonah, gave him the chore to go and warn Nineveh, that if you don't clean up your act, I'm going to destroy your city. We're not putting up with this stuff any longer. Jonah didn't want to do it. We know the story. He left town, jumped on a boat, going to go to another city entirely. Things got rough. They threw him overboard got picked up by a, a whale and he sloshed around in that whale's internal organs for three days. Finally hit the beach and got spit out. Hair all white. Clothes probably in tatters. No, it was a pretty rough experience. You, you can kind of understand. Jonah 4, verse 1, it pleased, displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He didn't want to get involved to begin with. He tried to stay away. He personally suffered through this whole thing. And then in the final of the whole event, what happens? Nineveh repents. The very thing. Jonah did not want to happen. And he told God, look, I told you this was going to happen. But no, you just went ahead and did it anyway. I was right. These people repented. That is awful. Now, brethren, I'm not going to go into detail here. But as just a small study, there is a reason why Jonah was angry about Nineveh. Keeping in mind, Nineveh was a capital city, uh, uh, an Assyrian capital city. And there had been wars and conflicts between Assyria and Israel for years. Do a little study, you'll find out why specifically Jonah was not in favor of giving these guys another warning. Just interesting. But continuing with Jonah, in Jonah 4, verse 6, and the Lord uh, uh, had prepared a uh, plant. It's called here a gourd. Apparently, Je uh, Jonah, when all was said and done, he went on the outskirts of the city, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before 
as I have told you in times past. Now here, I'm sure if you'd have been talking to Paul at this point, he would have paused to draw attention to the end of this verse, which I have told you in times past. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul warned the church that these elements of which anger and contention leads the list. These are not small issues. And to the extent that they're in our lives, we need to deal ex aggressively to strip them from our lives. And to the extent that we cling to them and permit them place in our lives, we are putting our relationship with God and Christ at risk. Continuing in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, just referring, we need to pay attention to the warnings that God's word gives us. Because while we live in an angry world, we walk in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, which Paul has assured us that against such there is no law. 